sure that it's being recorded. And the recording will be posted on the commission's webpage shortly after the meeting. PBW may be streaming this meeting live and archiving it for additional viewing opportunities. For everyone's reference, today's materials and agenda can be found under the first tab in the materials. As a reminder, again, if you are not a member of the commission, please turn off your camera. Vicki Lowe, Chair of the Universal Healthcare Commission, will now call the meeting to order. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to all our commission members. It is now 3.03 .03 and I call the April 14th meeting of the Universal Healthcare Commission to order. Um, I'll begin by doing a land acknowledgement. I forgot to ask if there was anybody else who wanted to do it. So let me know if you want to do the acknowledgement for our next meeting. I want to acknowledge that as we gather here today, we are all on the lands of indigenous people who have been um, stewards of the lands and waterways um, since time immemorial. In um, where I live, that is the land of my own ancestors, yeah. the Sklalem people or Nusklaim. Sklalem means strong people. And I thank them for the guidance and the shepherd, uh, shepherding of the land and waters here. Um, so thank you. Um, and then I wanna give a welcome to our presenters we have today. We've got some very interesting um, presentations ahead of us. And then I wanna um, welcome all the guests from the public who have come and who have submitted comments to us. Um, we'll go over the agenda really quick first and then we'll get right into it because it's once again a packed agenda. So we've already called the meeting to order. Um, Mandy will do roll call. We moved up the approval of the meeting minutes right after roll call and then we'll do public comments um, because the, then we'll go right into the um, presentations because the public comments will likely pertain to the presentations want to get them close together as possible. We have some legislative updates um, from, from Evan Klein and one of our own commissioners, Jane Byers, offered to give some updates. And then we're going to have um, a presentation from Dan Mews. Uh, from Princeton University about the federal coverage structures and some of the hurdles that we need to think about for financing a single payer system. And then we'll have Liz Arjun and Jer Gary Cohen from the Health Management Associates, the consultants who are helping us build the report to the legislature. So we'll be going over the piece, some of the pieces of the report. And then hopefully if all goes well, we'll be adjourning right around five o'clock. So, um, I just want to encourage everyone to um, participate in discussion. You know, these presentations are for us as commissioners to really have learn about and have conversations about how, um, you know, these pertain to the things that we need to do here in Washington state. So really thank you all for joining us today. And I will turn it over to Mandy to do our roll call. Thank you, Vicki. I will call members by first name in the order listed on the agenda, which is an alphabetical order by first name. When I call on you, please unmute your microphone and let us know that you are here and then mute your microphone again. Chair Vicki. Present. Senator Ann. Senator Ann. Fidisha. Here. Dave. Here. Senator Emily. Senator Emily? Estelle? Estelle? Jane? Here, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Joan? Joan? Representative Joe? Here. Karen? Karen? Kristen? And Kristen did already let me know that she would not be in attendance, but just checking in. Representative Marcus? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Mohammed? Here. 
Thank you. Thank you. Nicole? Here. Thank you. Thank you. And Stella? Stella? All right, I'll turn it back over to Commission Chair Vicki Lowe, who will facilitate review of the meeting summary and public comments. Thanks, Mandy. Thank so, you. Um, if you go to the second tab in your commission book, the notes are there from our previous meeting. The recording of the last meeting was also posted on the website, and you can see it here on the um, on the screen. So again, we're, we're going to use the consensus process to vote on the approval of the February meeting summary. Um, so I want to ask if there's any discussion about the notes. Anything that anybody noticed that needed to be changed, added? Okay. So I propose that we accept the meeting notes without any changes. Any discussion on that? Okay, um, if, I'll just, we'll just do voice vote. So all in favor, if you just wanna unmute and say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Same sign. Okay, the meeting's summary is approved. So um, we received some written public comments since our last meeting, and those are found under the third tab in your um, in your book. And so we will open the floor up for public comment. I do want to remind people that if you're not a commissioner, have your camera off, but while you're giving public comment, it's okay to turn it on. Um, we do allow people to sign up for public comments um, before the meeting, and Mandy has a list of those who have signed up. If you have not signed up and would like to provide public comment, please raise your hand and Mandy will call on you after we hear from those who have signed up. Um, if you are called upon, please state your name and your affiliation if you have one before speaking. Um, if you are unable to enter the chat function, we will provide an opportunity for additional comments. And then please do not raise your hand more than once. Um, it helps keep people in line so that we can call them in the order that, you know, so everyone has a chance to speak. Um, you're welcome to provide written comments as well. Uh, we have had quite a few people sign up. I think we're gonna give 90 seconds per person who wants to speak today. But again, if you feel like you didn't get everything in, please feel free to send written comments. So Mandy, would you please start the names of, with the names of the individuals who are providing public comment today? Yes, thank you, Vicki. The first person that I have is Mike Benefiel. Mike Benefield. All right, uh, we'll move on to Kelly Powers. Hi there. Um, thank you so much, commission members, staff and presenters. I'm Kelly Powers, a Cascade Care patient. So right in the thick of all of what we're doing. Um, Later today, you will see some slides about draft sections to be included in the November report. And the current draft includes the analysis that Model A would save 1.56 billion in total public and private healthcare spending in the first year. But the analysis also estimated that the Model A would save $5.6 billion annually after the first year. To put that savings in perspective, the Washington legislature agonized for two whole decades over finding $9 billion to shore up chronic underfunding of Washington public schools. So please, commissioners, have the report include the $5.6 billion annual savings in the November report, and it would give the governor, the legislators, and the public a more concrete picture, a, a concrete and complete picture of the fiscal analysis and also please include the assumptions. For example, the analysis assumed no cost sharing and still found these significant savings. So I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but um, 
I also wanted to bring up a major challenge that uh, that I didn't see anywhere in the in the presentations today about the underinsured, and it's um, really an unfortunate thing that just as we're getting really good at covering people, the number of underinsured is really going up. And I just hope that the commission will seek solutions to that and relieve Washingtonians of high premiums, cost sharing, and deductibles. If patients can't afford to use their insurance, what good is it? So I appreciate everyone at this meeting working towards universal health care, and I thank you so much. Thank you, Lynette Bears. Lynette Bears. Yes, I'm I'm on. Can you see me? Yes. Good. Yes, I'm Lynette Veers, and I am a registered nurse, and I am the president of Washington State Nurses Association. And I am here to tell you that yes, we nurses want universal health care, and we've been waiting for it for quite a while. I was on the work group, and uh, I think we worked pretty hard. We have some good information, much like Kelly just mentioned, in regards to the financial situation. I think that will probably be your toughest thing, but uh, there was a good uh, consultant um, group that helped us. So you've got people out there that are backing you. You know, in my nursing practice, uh, I found it emotionally painful, quite frankly, to try to take care of my patients when I had seen that they either had no insurance or they were being denied their care, medication, procedures. And it's tough to take care of people and, and have that sort of thing denied. Please change that. Please give us access. It will make my practice, other nurses practice, much easier. And also, American Nursing Association is pro-universal health care. So I wish you luck. You will be successful. Stay at it. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Curry? Chris Curry? I believe I saw you in there. Um, I'm Chris Curry, a retired RN from Spokane, and I would like to encourage the committee to begin working with health and human services soon regarding negotiating a section 1332 Medicare Medicaid waiver. When California State Representative Carla met with HHS staff last October, he was pleasantly surprised at how receptive they were to his single payer bill. And he was told that while health policy legislation must be passed, waiver authority can be granted prior to finalizing the single payer funding plan. In previous CMS guidance, uh, states have been encouraged to quote, reach out to the departments promptly for assistance in formulating a, an approach that meets the requirements of section 1332, unquote. With the sympathetic department that we have now, it might even be possible to use SB 5399 with some minor amendments added uh, as the basis for our waiver application. If there's any way we could obtain a 1332 waiver or at least determine the amount of the projected pass through funding before the full UHC plan is enacted, it would make passing that legislation much easier. So as soon as the commission's finance committee or perhaps even an ad hoc committee is set up, I would encourage it to immediately open a dialogue with Health and Human Services, inform them of our unique legislative situation with 5399 and UHC plan, find out exactly what additional legislative language is required for the waiver application, and begin to explore various ideas for using existing waiver processes to meet the state's goals for unified financing. We've never had an administration this open to single payer before, and we should take full advantage of their willingness to help while we can. Thank you so much for your work thus far. Thank you, Roger Collier. Roger Collier. Pamela Dalen. Okay, here we go. I, I unmuted. Um, Included in the public comment system section of today's meeting 
is my proposal for a Washington health care plan in, to combine the two goals of the bill which created the commission. The first one, to make immediate and impactful changes to our present health care system. And the second, to take the first steps towards a universal financing system. The, the proposal is realistic about the obstacles to creating a full universal system, and they are huge. They may be insurmountable but it also reflects the commission's unique opportunity to recommend changes to state law and regulations, changes that could cut healthcare costs by up to 10% for plan enrollees, help the uninsured gain coverage and move Medicaid beneficiaries more firmly into the mainstream. Commissioners, please read the plan proposal. And this is a formal request. Please give me a few minutes and a later meeting to discuss it. Commission members may not immediately leap in the air and shout Eureka, but the plan proposal does include details that should be helpful in developing commission recommendations. Now, also in the meeting materials today, there's pages supporting Dan Muse's discussion of hurdles to a state run financing system. This will be an enormously important part of this meeting and I have some comments. First, this is kind of a nit, but um, others may have noticed the insured percentages on pages five, Dan's pages five through eight, plus the uninsured percentage, total 115% of the population. Not bad, um, but not good either. Um, second, on page five, the comment about Medicare funding decisions being completely under federal control is, of course, untrue for Medicare Advantage. And Medicare Advantage is now approaching half of all Medicare enrollment. Third thing, also on page five, under biggest opportunities, I don't understand how Medicare monies could be diverted to fund non-Medicare programs, and I suspect it's probably illegal. Fourth, on page six, it's important to emphasize that no federal waiver can increase federal expenditures. Adding more lives or more benefits doesn't mean more funding. On page seven, the individual market numbers seem to exclude those who buy coverage direct from an insurer. This is the important population to look at because these are the people who believe they are getting a better deal by avoiding the state marketplace. In other words, they're the people who would much prefer to deal with the private sector than the government sector. And I think it would be important for the commissioners to determine what those reasons are. Six, last one, um, probably Dan Muse will make a similar point. On page 11, although literally hundreds of federal waivers have been granted, none comes remotely close to what would be needed to achieve universal financing. Uh, maybe the nearest is Maryland's hospital all-payer waiver, but this is now 40 years old and dates from when federal and private rates were much closer as opposed to the enormous gulf between, for example, Medicaid and commercial insurance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pamela? I just saw your name, Pamela. Can hello 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 you 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 stop my video it says can you hear me i can hear you i don't okay. hear oh here no i see it you should you. be able to turn on your video thank you um my name is pamela dolan and i'm a registered nurse a member of the school nurses of washington snow while, the study, while studying the material, meeting materials, I was struck by the numbers, $61.4 billion per annum, I believe is our state healthcare budget. And according to the data put forth by Roger Collier, although I don't agree with his uh, whole plan, 25 to 30% of the administrative costs of our current, are the administrative costs of our current system. And uh, that's up to $20 billion. We could use this money for care improvements, the universal health care work group determination uh, stated by the Optimus consultant stated that by the second year of um, option A, we would be saving 
$5.5 million per year. As to current issues for the commission, there are immediate issues that a finance committee can begin to work on. I would like to call for the commission to begin to look now and a finance, work now on a finance committee um, called for an SB 5399. I support the um, I support the formation of an ad hoc committee with expertise to make recommendations on the finance committee formation to build step by step towards true effective universal health care for all Washington people. Also, I want to ask for further transparency um, about consultants. Wait a second, I have to get rid of this thing here. Um, engage to work with the commission. I would like to see this process published on the website, including the request for quotes and qualifications. Thank you so much for your diligent work thus far. You, you understand that it is Washington healthcare solvency that you are fighting for. Thank you for understanding the human tragedy of our dysfunctional addiction to allowing industry to handle healthcare. We're far more costly in human terms than the numbers highlight is the ruining of people's ability to work, care, contribute, and even live when care is delayed and denied for profit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcia Sedman. Marcia yes. Sedman. Thank you. Can you hear me, see me? I don't see me. I can I... both. Uh, Pamela, yeah. would you turn off your computer, your uh, monitor, please? Thank you. Go ahead, Marcia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, my name is Marcia Stedman. I'm um, a, a member of board member of Healthcare for All Washington, and um, I was a um, wrapped um, a viewer of the Universal Healthcare Work Group. So I really appreciate the background that Health Management Associates will present today. Uh, most was developed out of the work group that met from 2019 to 2020. And it's important that the members of this commission who were not part of the previous work group be aware of this work that has gone before. It's also important to have the full scope of their work, which I hope that will be addressed in um, the final report that is submitted to the legislature. You know, I've heard that it's all about the prices, stupid, <laughs> and it's also about the middlemen. Even before we have all the data from the Healthcare Cost Transparency Board, we can see that it's impossible for the cost of universal health care under a publicly administered system to be more expensive than our current system. Currently, we have our cost of health care includes the cost of multiple executives, the cost of shareholder profits, the cost of duplicate services, the doctor cost to interface with multiple insurance companies, and the insurer's cost to deny coverage and claims. Other costs are patients' time and stress, sorting out payment issues that they have with the current system. So I would like to hold up um, Pamela Dolan's um, re recommendation that, we urge that the commission move quickly to create an ad hoc committee to make recommendations for the creation of a finance committee to do a, do a better job with the financing in a publicly um, funded manner. This is um, mentioned in the report of the April meeting materials on page 17, um, so that it can comply with one of its core charges from the legislature. And I hope that the commission will keep in mind the basic accounting principles mentioned above as they consider the governance issues presented on page 77 of the April meeting materials. I add my voice to those appreciating the work of this commission and the dedication that the commission members will show as they go forward and to the opportunity for the public to participate in this way and the opportunity to make my own comments here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maureen Brink-Lund. Thank you very much. And thank you to the commission and to my fellow commentators. Um, this is all very inspiring work that is being done. 
Um, I just would like to comment on the chart on page 69 of the meeting materials called the Universal Health Systems Analysis. The chart shows dollars related to expenditures and potential savings for covered populations. And it shows the numbers for the three models created by the Universal Healthcare Work Group, uh, whose meetings I also attended uh, for the most part. I think at least um, I must have gotten the last three quarters of the meeting, so I saw the final report being presented. The first thing I noticed in this chart only covers the first year, which is really disappointing to me because I know that Model A in subsequent years uh, created huge um, savings, continued to create huge savings. And so um, those savings far outstripped Model B, the next runner up. Model C could not be predicted, which is itself a disqualifying characteristic, I would say. The way the numbers are displayed on the chart, as I got to looking at this, um, I noticed that the way the numbers are displayed on the chart also downplays the dramatic savings of Model A. Uh, relative to Model B in just this first year. Model A savings are expressed in billions and Model B or savings are expressed in millions. If you look more closely, because you have to look really closely to figure that out because there's just one tiny letter difference in those words. Um, if all the numbers were shown in billions, Model A's oh, savings the first year of 2.4 billion um, would be listed that way, but Model B's, which is now listed with the number 738, millions, but you can barely see that, uh, would instead be listed as 0.738 billion or three quarters of 1 billion. In other words, Model A savings of 2.4 billion already quite impressive, which is a full 1.6 billion more than, Model, A, uh, than um, Model B in that first year. And then I kept looking at the chart and it makes, um, it looks like we're comparing apples to apples, but in fact, you know, model um, these models differ in the population way too. Model C does not include everyone, and it keeps the healthcare administration in the for-profit sector. Model B includes all the state residents, but it continues to rely on this um, Byzantine administration, many insurers, as, as is currently the case. So both B and C are driven by the profit motive and can't help themselves but be overburdened by administrative costs. Model A includes all residents, is a single payer approach. It eliminates those excesses. And furthermore, there's no cost sharing under Model A and that is not expressed in this chart at all. So I think uh, it's just a note to say, we need to see the whole uh, business of this kind of um, information, not just bits and pieces. Um, so uh, it's a universal system, Model A is, and it, there's something quite unique that happens when you have universal coverage and a single payer that just doesn't show up anywhere else. It saves vast amount of money and it makes everyone able to access healthcare. So everyone in, no one out, and your costs go down. How amazing is that? So I hope in the work of this um, commission that you'll take time to carefully look at things like these older reports, the work groups um, product and see what really lies in there and that you have more opportunity to delve into those numbers more closely. So I appreciate the time and thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you, Catherine Lewandowski. Hang on here, okay. Um, hello, my name is Katherine Lewandowski and I am a registered nurse here in Washington. Um, I'm speaking today here representing, representing whole Washington and we are a grassroots organization that has been working since 2017, specifically to facilitate the enactment of a single payer universal healthcare system here in Washington. I first wanna thank you very much to all the members of the commission for your time and dedication to the goals of achieving true healthcare reform for the citizens of Washington and for continuing to push forward the goals of the Universal Healthcare Work Group. I want to re reinforce that we support you in your efforts and hope to make it easier for you to achieve the best outcomes for the collective residents of our state. As we go into another midterm voting cycle, I feel it is important to remind everyone that true healthcare reform has been one of the main topics of discussion during each election cycle for almost the entirety of my adult life. 
We have had so many promises made to us by candidates for election and re-election, and yet we've been sadly disappointed each cycle as we are then told that healthcare is very complicated and that we must go slow and be cautious, or we are told blatantly that our dreams of a truly comprehensive universal healthcare system in the United States will never be a reality. Frankly, we are getting tired of these empty promises and hollow excuses. We are now hopefully coming out of the worst pandemic I have ever experienced in my 35 year career in nursing. And many of the projected disadvantages of our for-profit healthcare system have had the curtain pulled back on the naked shortcomings of the system we have created. We need to take this opportunity to pull up our shorts so that we can go out into the world again with our heads held high. We need to be able to swallow our pride and we realize that we are not reinventing the wheel here, that there are many ways that we can achieve our stated goals. We must realize that our current system of allowing for-profit health insurance companies and equity investors to use our taxpayer healthcare dollars to encourage, is that the right word? our elected officials to cement the insatiable as appetites of our health insurance companies into our healthcare is no longer acceptable. There are many examples around the world on how healthcare can be done better at less cost to our citizens and with much improved quality and length of life. Until we can pass laws that give our government the ability to tightly control those equity investors, we just cannot allow them to keep raiding our healthcare system any longer. Unfortunately, their, president, their presence has not achieved our leaders' goals of controlling the skyrocketing costs of healthcare, but rather those for-profit companies have gleefully rejoiced in those skyrocketing costs as they fight to reduce care and increase their profit margins. We know that we must change course quickly. I understand that this loss of projected profits may be difficult for them to accept, but it is time that we look to the examples and recommendations of many other industry experts in healthcare finance and delivery, both here and across the globe, and design a system that will be truly sustainable for our children and grandchildren. For those that feel that if we quickly move to a single payer system that it might be too disruptive, I ask, have you ever lost your job and seen how that disrupts your life? especially when you receive your first COBRA notice and you realize that there is no way you can pay those premiums for very long? Or have you ever had a change in your health status where you may have been fine last week, but now you've just received news that you've been so very, very tired because you have acute leukemia? Or maybe you were going well, doing well until you were hit by a, that uninsured motorist and now you can't work and you get the joy of fighting with their insurance company to get the care you need. I understand that it's tough to be in those sink or swim situations. And if we are collectively trying to stay afloat in a life raft with too many holes in it, we will all sink. So while I am, I am sort of okay with throwing you a life preserver, I just can't allow you to sink the raft for all of us. So to the for-profit insurance supporters here, you've been sinking the raft and you will need to start swimming on your own and experience the struggle of having your life plans disrupted. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak today. Thank you. And I don't see any other hands raised. I'm just gonna give it one last opportunity to put a call to see if anybody else has any other public comments that has not spoken yet already. I'll turn it over back to Vicki. All right, thanks Mandy. Thank you everyone for your comments. We really appreciate how much um, input we get from the public. I uh, want to move on next to our first presentation, which is legislative updates. We have Evan Klein from the um, Washington State Healthcare Authority and our own commissioner, uh, Jane Beyer from OIC. And I believe Evan is going first. I think so. Thanks, Vicki. Mm -hmm. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Evan Klein. I'm the special assistant for uh, legislative and policy affairs here at the Washington Healthcare Authority, and happy to be with you on this, I guess, now sunny afternoon after our brief snow this morning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about just kind of some scoping on, you know, this past legislative session and give you a sense of um, how kind of uh, extraordinary it was for uh, us as an agency and as a state. Um, and then a couple of the big priority items that uh, will be impacting uh, our agency and, and 
areas where we'll be uh, and new programs we'll be implementing over the next couple of years and then hand it over to Jane to talk a little bit more about the commercial market as well. So just for some sense of scope for you all it was a short legislative session. Uh, but we all know anyone who is kind of close to this, um, there, there was a lot of additional revenue that came into the state in advance of the session uh, to the tune of over $5 billion in new general fund state spending uh, budget, wide, you know, statewide. Um, the healthcare authority's budget uh, increased by over $1.5 billion this year, and that's both um, federal and state funding. That's investment uh, across a suite of new programs, um, including uh, some rate increases and uh, different um, reimbursement increases across our existing Medicaid programs and the creation of some new programs, which I'll touch on as well. Um, we as an agency, we analyzed over 200 uh, piece, uh, policy, a piece of policy legislation this year and uh, received over 55 new reporting requirements. So just to give you some sense of, of scope there, a pretty big year, especially for a supplemental uh, budget. Uh, on the policy bill side, I'm really only going to touch on one bill. Uh, there are two others that had some impacts uh, specific to, uh, or I'm going to touch on two bills. There are a couple others that had uh, specific impacts to the agency that Jane's going to cover. So I'm going to leave those to her knowing we're a little short on time today. Um, the first I'm going to touch on is uh, Senate Bill 5589 uh, around primary care expenditures. Uh, this directed the Healthcare Cost Transparency Board to really focus some of its work around primary care and analyzing progress towards spending 12% of total statewide healthcare expenditures on primary care spending. Uh, there's some requirements to define what primary care means, ascertain data to assess uh, spending on primary care, and look towards uh, the structures and incentives for achieving desired levels of primary care spending in the state. So there are some annual reporting requirements that are going to come out of that and that I know the Healthcare Cost Transparency Board is um, already getting underway at planning for that work. Uh, so more to come over the next year plus, um, but really interesting um, kind of novel policy there uh, in terms of the state's direction on, on overall healthcare spending. Uh, and then the other was uh, Senate Bill 5532, which established a prescription drug affordability board. Um, so the board uh, is going to be required to identify drugs that have been on the market for seven years um, that are dispensed at retail uh, and not solely used to treat a rare disease that meet certain other criteria and then do affordability reviews of some of those drugs. Uh, there's also some provisions in the legislation that permit the board to set up for payment limits on up to 12 drugs uh, beginning in uh, 2027. So a little bit of a long ramp time for some of that work to get up and running, uh, but just in terms of you know, new work that's coming to the agency in terms of you know, uh, overall healthcare spending, looking at healthcare costs and healthcare cost trends, um, there's a new board that's gonna be coming online uh, from this past legislative session. Uh, a ton in the behavioral health space and a lot of work around housing uh, that I'm not gonna focus on today, that is not to suggest that any of those pieces of policy aren't important or going to be really critical to um, the work that we're doing as an agency over the next couple of years or, or Washingtonians who need coverage, um, but just kind of not the focus of the presentation today. So happy to take questions, but, um, but, but not going to touch on all of that. Um, in terms of budget items, there are a couple of kind of uh, specific uh, pieces of the budget that I think might be really pertinent for, for this group and your deliberations about universal coverage. Uh, the first of which was uh, a proviso that directed uh, the healthcare authority to beginning in uh, January of 2024, stand up a new program for individuals who are uninsured, uh, earning under 138% of the federal poverty level. Uh, so really focusing on coverage gaps that exist today, individuals who don't have access uh, to, uh, to Medicare, to Medicaid, uh, to individual market coverage uh, who might be at the lower end of the income threshold. Uh, so work underway here to begin implementation of that program. Uh, funding for continuous enrollment for, for children up to age six. Uh, so this is um, some funding to supplement uh, um, some of the work that's going on. Uh, so authorization to spend some of the work that's going on uh, with the 1115 transformation waiver um, around continuous enrollment for children. Uh, and then a, a whole suite of provider reimbursement rate increases. So just thinking uh, about how this might be notable for your, your discussions and your deliberations, as you think about um, you know, market segmentation, impacts of uh, consolidation, trying to think about parity across different markets. Um, you know, we in Medicaid you know, uh, obviously are always thinking about how can 
uh, we ensure that there's access for um, Medicaid clients in Washington state. So how, how can we ensure that there's a robust delivery system that exists? And then obviously um, that, that um, individuals can get into the providers that they need. Um, and so there were a suite of investments from the legislature this year across uh, the behavioral health workforce um, with private duty nursing, uh, group homes, children's dental, uh, for opioid treatment providers, uh, medical respite and crisis response. Um, you know, we know these, these investments are kind of critical for, for the workforce and for providers who have been struggling during COVID, um, but also to just kind of build up additional workforce and ensure that there's more entry into the workforce. So you saw, you know, especially in the behavioral health space, um, an investment of $100 million for this current year for 2022, um, through kind of uh, one-time payments to providers for uh, retention and hiring. Uh, and then uh, a supplemental kind of 7% rate increase that begins next year for that behavioral health workforce as well. So kind of big, big investments from the legislature, things that um, we're excited about uh, in terms of driving, driving that funding out, we know was, was critical to um, the provider community and to individuals who need to access that care. Um, so I'm going to pause there. Uh, there's obviously a ton more. Um, like I said, a lot in the behavioral health space, a lot of physical health provisions uh, in the budget and in, in policy bills as well. Uh, but I know we're a little short on time and I want to make sure that Jane has some time to cover the commercial side. So. Thanks, Evan. Hey. Hi, everybody. I'm Jane Beyer. I'm, uh, I am having a great time serving on the commission. And I am also Commissioner Kreidler's Senior Health Policy Advisor. So I'm gonna to talk to you today really quickly about three bills. I think Evan's comments, we all know how important the budget is to health policy. And I think this year really illustrated that. So the first uh, bill that I'm gonna to talk to you about, House Bill 1688, and there's some information in your materials. I think it's starting on page 27. First of all, thank you to Representative Schmick for your leadership on us helping to get this bill through. It was completely bipartisan and we always love working on bills that are bipartisan. So many of you know that in 2019, our legislature enacted its our own state balanced billing law to protect people from surprise billing when they go to the emergency room or when they go to a hospital or for planned surgery. And then Congress came along in December of 2020 and said, we think we should pass this legislation as well. And so the legislature really was remarkably supportive about passing legislation this session that would essentially align the two laws. And I think the points that I wanna raise that are most important is that the scope of services that are protected from balanced billing is broadened now it not only includes when you go into the emergency room, but also after you're stabilized um, in the emergency room. And it applies to a broader set of services when somebody is getting, for example, a scheduled procedure at a hospital or an ambulatory surgical facility. Secondly, we were very pleased that Congress said to the states, if you wanna be more protective of the consumers, that's fine. And so we retain the provision in our legislation that says that a provider or a hospital cannot ask somebody to waive their balance billing protections. There are some health plans where that can still happen in limited circumstances. Those are what we call self-funded group health plans. And, um, but the most important thing is that nobody can require a consumer to give up their balance billing protections. And then, I know um, Evan didn't focus in on behavioral health, but we do wanna note that an important provision of this legislation says that when you need behavioral health emergency services, just like you can walk into a hospital emergency room, whether it's in network or out of network and get that emer those emergency services coverage, the same thing will happen now if you have a behavioral health emergency and a mobile rapid crisis response team comes out or you go to an evaluation and treatment facility or a crisis triage facility. And we think that's really, really important in terms of having that benefit be meaningful. And so just wanted to let you know that we have a series of webinars that we've already scheduled in the last week of April and the first week of May. And so I will send Mandy the notice of all of those webinars and hopefully she can share them with the commission 
So if anybody wants to register, they're more than welcome. And then the table that's up on the screen right now is just a little bit more detail in terms of what's in the bill. So the next bill that I wanted to talk about is um, some of us have heard, many of us have heard about how incredibly challenging it is for people who need specialty medications, expensive specialty medications, to be able to afford to continue to receive those medications to manage serious and chronic illness. So the legislature did pass Senate Bill 5610. You'll often hear it referred to as the copay accumulator bill. And essentially this legislation says that private health plans need to count the value of third party payments, including manufacturers coupons toward a consumer's health plan deductible and their maximum out of pocket if a drug doesn't have a generic equivalent or a therapeutic equivalent that's a preferred drug on their health plans formulary, or if a consumer has been able to have a drug covered as what's called an exception process that we have under state law. This was, um, this and the surprise billing legislation were probably the two highest priorities for consumer advocates when it comes to commercial health insurance. And then finally, since we have both Representative Richelli and Representative Schmick on the commission, there was legislation that revised the condition for coverage of audio only telemedicine. The legislature last session took a big step to make audio only telemedicine a part of telemedicine coverage in Washington state. And there's a provision that effective January 1 of next year says that a person has to have an established relationship with a provider before they can get audio only telemedicine coverage. And after some good work by the University of Washington Telemedicine Collaborative last year, they came back to this year's legislature and asked if the legislature could modify that definition and broaden out access somewhat to audio only telemed services. So I talked fast, true to my New York upbringing and um, would be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from, oh. Go ahead, Nicole. Oh, I was just going to ask Jane, uh, what was that bill number for the audio only telemedicine? House Bill 1821. You, I know, Evan, you have to go any second. Any questions for Evan or, or Jane from commissioners? I'll just add in the silence because I, I skipped over it and didn't touch on it, but Jane did cover it, you know, with um, House Bill 1688 around balance billing. We did hear a lot uh, from uh, the behavioral health provider community and, and stakeholders that the agency regularly engages with uh, in the behavioral health community about those behavioral health crisis response provisions that are in the bill, um, very supportive of the work that was done to include those in, in final passage of that legislation. So I just wanted to note that, you know, in terms of impacts to the agency, certainly something that we, we have been tracking all session as well. Thank you. Okay, last call for questions or comments. All right, thank you, Evan. Thanks, Jane. Oh. Um, so questions and comments for commissioners, sorry. Um, okay, so our next speaker is Dan Muse, who's the Deputy Director of State Health and Value Strategies at Princeton University. And he's gonna provide us with some insights into federal coverage structures and hurdles for state-run healthcare financing systems. So thank you for joining us, Dan. Thank you, Chair Lowe, uh, and thank you to the commissioners for welcoming me today. Uh, my name is Dan Muse. I'm the Deputy Director of the State Health and Value Strategies Program, which is a program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We're located at Princeton University's School of Public and International Affairs, where I also serve on the faculty. Um, and the, the kind of discussion today is uh, about how federal programs that provide healthcare and health coverage 
um, to millions of Americans um, create hurdles for states um, as they seek to engage in their own work. Um, and so on the next slide, you'll see kind of the ways that we see people getting their coverage, right? So generally there are these public programs, and this is in a post-ACA world, public programs, Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP. Um, these are kind of major coverage programs um, that provide uh, health benefits to uh, folks based on an entitlement, uh, right? So for Medicare, that entitlement is you're 65, you have 40 quarters of uh, wages um, and wherein you paid into the Medicare trust fund um, through your taxes and you get Medicare um, from then on. Uh, Medicaid is an in, uh, mostly an income-based program. There are also elements of Medicaid uh, that are needs-based um, and Medicaid represents a, a state and federal partnership. Um, and then there's the CHIP program, uh, which is a children's health insurance program uh, uh, kind of focused uh, again on income eligibility. So these are your public programs. And then on the other side of the slide is your employer programs, right? And this is, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, a, a relic of uh, the post-war um, economy, uh, post-World War II economy in the United States, wherein there were wage restrictions. And so employers leveraged health benefits um, as a way to entice employers, uh, employees and keep employees. Um, most, but not all employers offer coverage um, to their full-time employees. Some offer to part-time employees. Um, and so you have um, kind of wide variation in the employer market. And then you have the self uh, kind of the self-only folks, right? The people who go and buy insurance on their own, um, they can go to the marketplace. Um, nowadays, uh, at least for all of 2022, um, with significant um, federal subsidies, um, uh, limiting uh, the cost of premiums uh, to uh, eight and a half percent, nine and a half percent of your income. And so you have a um, a subsidy structure there. Um, and some of the changes the ACA made were that no one could be denied coverage if they can pay. One of the exceptions uh, is undocumented populations. And I know that Washington is in the middle of looking at a 1332 waiver to address uh, access to coverage programs for undocumented persons. So on the next slide, I'm gonna start to kind of dig into the programs and talk about how they impact how states can engage and how a state like Washington um, could work on um, its own unified universal healthcare system. Um, so the, uh, it's, Medicare is likely the largest hurdle uh, for states when it comes to the public programs. Um, you'll see that the, um, the kind of approximate numbers of enrollees in Washington have come from different sources and that's partially because data on where folks get covered changes all the time and some um, uh, there are some numbers that are newer and easier to find and some numbers that are older um, and so they don't always add up. Um, also uh, folks can be enrolled in more than one coverage at any given time. So the when it comes to Medicare, uh, the way that Medicare is structured is that uh, it is kind of wholly owned by the federal government. They set the rules for all elements of Medicare. So part A, which is your inpatient hospital coverage, part B, which is your outpatient um, and um, kind of independent physician coverage. Also part B is where you get um, pharmaceuticals that are um, kind of provided by a, um, a physician or other provider in their practice, right? So if you're thinking about um, chemotherapy, right, where you would go to a clinic to get your chemotherapy drugs, those are included in Part B coverage. Um, part C is Medicare Advantage. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then Part D is your prescription drugs. So the feds kind of control through a process of uh, kind of partnership with provider organizations and with some um, requirements uh, built into the statutory structure on how hospitals get paid, what those payments rate, rates are, the models for um, how hospitals get paid, how physicians get paid. Um, and so that's kind of all within the Center for Medicare Services uh, at uh, CMS uh, in the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. 
Medicare Advantage is an alternative option for, uh, for Americans um, who can choose to enroll with a private insurance company who meets um, a set of standards also set by the Center for Medicare Services. Um, so CMS has their kind of managed, uh, their, their kind of uh, original Medicaid, uh, I'm sorry, Medicare uh, unit. These are the folks that set those rates, that make those, the payments, ensure that, uh, that um, hospitals, providers are meeting the guidelines. And then there's the uh, Medicare Advantage uh, segment of CMS, which contracts with the Medicare Advantage companies, ensures that those Medicare Advantage companies are meeting the guidelines set by the federal government. Some uh, states have also engaged and have oversight over how Medicare Advantage plans operate in their states. Not every state has uh, kind of takes a, a very active role in that process. So there are two states that have um, a level of control over their Medicare payment rates in a way that really no other state does. And those two states are uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania. So Maryland uh, is a state that had for uh, nearly 40 years, um, a uh, kind of agreement with the federal government on how it was setting rates in, uh, in its healthcare system. So unlike the 49 other states in DC, uh, Maryland has a commission that says, this is what hospitals are going to get paid in our system. Um, it will uh, say that, uh, you know, certain hospitals are going to get paid a little bit different if they take different types of insurance, right? So there are going to be levels of payment. Um, but generally, there are um, rates set by uh, the Healthcare Cost Commission in Maryland. So uh, in uh, 2013, 2014, uh, Maryland engaged with CMMI, which is a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which was created under the Affordable Care Act, uh, to design and implement um, what they refer to as um, their um, kind of statewide waiver. Um, and what this does is it allows Maryland to continue to set rates uh, for Medicare payments um, in the Affordable Care Act context. Uh, and leverage savings from those uh, kind of as compared to what it, they, the rates would be without the waiver um, into other population health uh, opportunities. So they can drive those dollars into um, diabetes care um, and other chronic illness uh, and population health programs. Pennsylvania um, engaged uh, CMMI on a, a similar waiver in that it took control over hospital payments, um, but it did so in a more limited way. And so what Pennsylvania did was create um, an opt-in model for rural hospitals in Western Pennsylvania to opt in to a waiver-based uh, payment program that would allow those, uh, those hospitals to transition away from fee-for-service, wherein they get paid for every procedure that they do or every admission that they have. Um, and so the incentive was, we just got to keep doing things. That doesn't work as populations decline. Um, and so the hospitals were struggling. Shifted to a global budget where a, a hospital uh, was kind of given um, a whole budget and said, here, you can um, operate under this budget. And you don't have to worry about um, you know, how many MRIs you're doing. We're going to hold you to some quality requirements, um, and that kind of provides the level of flexibility and savings uh, in Pennsylvania. And I think it's important to know that there are those two waivers out there um, that states have to uh, have some control over Medicare payments, but that's the extent of it at this point. Uh, so what happens with Medicare and why is it a challenge for states? So the federal government right now is responsible for any financial risk. If Medicare gets really expensive for some reason or another, so reasons could include um, a uh, expansion of disease, uh, a increase in life expectancy, and so you have folks that are living much longer, and as they live longer, their healthcare costs uh, are increasing over time. Um, new drugs, new therapies um, that can be very expensive the federal government becomes responsible for those financial risks. And in a scenario in which the Medicare population is managed by um, 
an entity that is not the federal government, that financial risk would transition to that entity, potentially Washington. Medicare is portable, right? And so I'm sure you have family members or friends um, who have moved. I live in Rhode Island. Um, and so I have uh, grandparents that decided that they didn't like the winters anymore. Um, and so now they live in warm climates. They take their Medicare with them. Um, and that means that uh, they're paying the same amount. Um, the premiums are the same wherever they go. Um, and every, uh, can, every hospital in the country takes Medicare. And so they feel comfortable uh, in that uh, kind of portability. Um, and Medicare is the biggest single revenue line for most hospitals. Um, the, while Medicare does not cover the most number of people, nor does it pay the highest rates, um, folks that are using hospital services tend to be Medicare eligible. Um, I highlighted the opportunity that can it, depending on how a waiver is structured and depending on what Washington is able to negotiate with the federal government, Medicare is a place to find savings. Uh, the savings that have come out of the Maryland waiver, and that's just in hospitals, um, are immense. Um, and there are there really is an opportunity here to dig in. And even if you're kind of taking a slice of, um, of savings in the Medicare budget, that, those are big dollars uh, and dollars that the state can really work with. So on the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Medicaid um, and CHIP. So Medicaid and CHIP um, are kind of sibling programs um, and they operate in very much the same way in that they are a federal state partnership. Um, states will have um, kind of operational control over the programs within some guidelines and the federal government will be a far financial participant. They don't pay everything, but they pay big chunks um, of the costs of care uh, for folks in Medicaid. As I mentioned, Medicaid from an eligibility perspective is often income-based. There are some Medicaid programs um, that are simply needs-based and income doesn't matter. But in most cases, you have an income or an income and medical need uh, determination to qualify for Medicaid. So because Medicaid is this federal state partnership, um, this is an opportunity for states to kind of do with it what they think they want to do. There are some states who are kind of very much hands off on Medicaid. They have relatively low eligibility levels. They kind of meet the check boxes um, that are required from the federal government um, and they don't innovate. There are other states and Washington and uh, under the leadership at the healthcare authority um, is one of these states that really looks to drive change in the healthcare system through their Medicaid program, um, through what's referred to as demonstration waivers, the 1115 waivers um, that you might be, uh, have heard about. These are ways to add populations to Medicaid, um, change the way uh, payments are made to providers and so that it looks a little bit different uh, than kind of a traditional Medicaid program, change the way funding is directed. Um, and so these waivers really represent um, an interesting point of federal flexibility in the Medicaid program that states have taken advantage of and that Washington could take advantage of as it looks to a unified system. Um, some of the major challenges is that the federal government must approve changes. And so this is a political risk because this really depends on who inside the federal government um, is leading um, and, and that kind of administration's view on, uh, on waivers. Um, you, this um, new administration, the Biden administration, for the first time in the history of Medicaid waivers, um, rescinded waivers when it came into office. Um, so Texas and Florida um, and Georgia all had waivers that were approved um, at the kind of waning days of the Trump administration um, and that they were um, put on hold, reevaluated, um, and uh, in the case of Texas and Georgia are still under evaluation uh, nearly 18 months later. Uh, Medicaid's other big challenge here is you get a whole bunch of flexibility, but there's not a lot of dollars. Um, and so there's uh, Medicaid pays less than Medicare and in commercial insurance. Um, and providers tend not to be interested in, in expansions of Medicaid because of payment rates. Um, Medicaid also covers 
long-term services and supports, behavioral health, persons with developmental disabilities. So you have a large group um, of persons that are covered under Medicaid um, that um, represent a very different model of healthcare and different needs than what we kind of traditionally think of as health insurance coverage. Um, on the next slide, you have your marketplace uh, and individual market. So this is um, a, a program that is kind of very much a federal, state, and private sector partnership, wherein um, the federal government provides subsidies for affordability through tax credits. States operationalize the, and regulate the individual market, and the individual market is provided by private insurance companies. Um, so what do flexibilities look like here? Um, it's what we refer to as the 1332 waivers, how states can change um, the models and the way that folks receive this, uh, their coverage. Um, and if savings are available, states can receive that savings back. There are limits on how states can innovate. And there are kind of requirements that are in the statutory language about, and they're kind of referred to as the guardrails, about what changes can do. Um, and the biggest things are that you can't change the individual market in a way that fewer people get coverage. Um, and that, that means you could move people out of the individual market into other, other coverage, but they have to retain coverage. Um, and you can't um, kind of uh, lose benefits um, or make things less affordable for folks. Um, one of the challenges here is that it relies on the current insurance system um, and a transition to a universal uh, and unified funded uh, healthcare system probably is some disruption to the current insurance system. Um, and so kind of when you look at the individual market and what would be required to be changed, relying on the current insurance system makes it tough to work with. Um, however, how to get to consumers, uh, right? When we think about Washington Health Plan Finder and the exchange and how they talk to consumers, how they help consumers choose coverage that works for them, that's well established. It works well. Um, and hundreds of thousands of folks are able to engage with the exchange to get coverage. Um, and so that model becomes easy to scale if you can find something that works. On the next slide, I want to dig into the employer market. And as much as Medicare is the toughest nut to crack when it comes to public programs, the employer market um, is likely um, unbreakable without some level of legislative change. Um, so the employer market, um, and I often refer to this as ESI, Employer Sponsored Insurance, um, kind of represents the most people. Um, in Washington, this was in 2019, um, 58 percent of the population had employer-sponsored coverage. Um, that's a pretty average uh, around the country. There are two models for employer-sponsored coverage. Um, and I think it's important to recognize how different they are. So the fully insured model, and this is, um, if you think about a group of employers, um, they all have, hey, anywhere from five to 10 to 100, maybe even 200 employees. And they say, I'm going to kind of jump in with a bunch of other employers and the insurance company is going to be the person that brings us together. Um, and I'm going to say, what does the risk pool look like with all these folks in there? Uh, and how much am I going to have to pay? How much is each employee going to cost me? That's fully insured, right? Where there's a large insurance pool of, of multiple employers that's regulated um, kind of at the state level. Uh, the other model for, uh, for employer-sponsored coverage is what we call self-insured. And so that's where an employer might say, I want, I'm going to take the risk of all of the costs for the health insurance, uh, for the health care for my employees. I'm going to work with an insurance company that I usually call a third-party administrator or a TPA. They're going to help me manage those benefits. Um, but in essence, me as the employer, I'm the one that's on the hook for all the costs. Whereas in the fully insured, the kind of group of employers is at risk. And so it's uh, the risk is spread. Usually self-insured plans represent large employers. Um, however, there has been a, um, an effort since the Affordable Care Act passed to get uh, smaller and smaller employers to go into the self-insured coverage, um, including employers as small as 20 or 25 employees, 
uh, where you have an employer that's taking on all of that risk. So what does that mean? That means if you have one employee who happens to get a diagnosis uh, where uh, it is very expensive, um, it could uh, be very challenging for the employer to come up with the costs that are required. Here's the kicker with the self-insured market. It is protected by a federal law called ERISA. Um, ERISA generally, and in almost all cases, is not uh, kind of preempts any state law. So. Uh, it becomes kind of the law of the land. Um, and the Supreme Court said as recently as 2015, states can't mess with it. I see a question. I don't know, Chair, if you want me to pause, yeah. I can take that now. Sure, go ahead, Representative Michelli. Uh, thank you. And um, maybe this is a, it might be a question for David. Um, uh, can you remind me of the public employer uh, portion of that? Yeah, so uh, right. So if you're thinking about PEB and um, and kind of the other levels of uh, of state employee or public employee benefits, they operate as a self-insured plan. Um, so they're going to operate um, under ERISA um, in most cases, but some states are going to have different models. So I know of one state that dumps a lot of their employees into a um, uh, into a, a kind of more fully insured market. There are also um, kind of some uh, differences, especially when it comes to unionized workforces um, and unionized workforces operate under a different federal statute, the uh, Taft-Hartley Act. Um, and so I think in general, you have these models um, wherein um, the kind of operations from the outside look like the kind of large employers. Um, one of the differences um, for a public employee uh, benefit program is that, yes, they have to operate under kind of the same structures as of ERISA. However, because it's a publicly funded system and it's operated by government, your laws get to kind of apply, right? So if we think about kind of what gets preempted by ERISA, um, maybe you say, you know, you have to tell us um, kind of all of your costs, right? You have to submit all of your claims to a database so we know, if, you know, large employer, um, what's being paid. Um, the large employer can say, I don't have to do that because ERISA prevents me from doing, you know, from having to follow that regulation or requirement. Um, you can tell through your legislative process, you are public employee benefits fund um, to kind of report back to you in the state because you get to control it. Kind of you're like their board of directors. Real quick, this is Dave Eisinger. Um, Since I oversee the PEB and SEP programs, just a few <laughs> little pieces there. Um, we have a mix of self and fully insured for both programs, but for the PEB program, it's about uh, two thirds self-insured lives and one third fully insured, and it's flipped in the school employee sub population. And just as a benchmark reminder, if there's 4.3 million, 4.38 million residents, we have about 700,000 of them between the PEB and sub program. So about 16% of that population. And I think you did a great job, Dan, of kind of describing, I always say we have ERISA-like federal statutes, which are the Public Health Services Act. It's ERISA-like, but it's not exactly, but there are, there's a lot of nuances like you were starting to hint at, but just a couple of demographic things here for us. Yeah, I appreciate it. I was looking at, uh, at just a, a refresher and reminder. I forgot how many employees at that 700,000 mark, 16%. Uh, I appreciate that. And that is employers, dependents, and retirees. Okay. 100,000 of them are retirees, roughly. Um, so as we look at kind of the, the uh, charge of the commission and the employer market, one of the challenges is that multi-state employers um, seek national coverage systems, right? So a large multi-state employer is going to be self-insured so that they can um, kind of contract with a large national insurer to provide um, those, that coverage uh, kind of to all of their employees, right? So uh, if you think about, uh, you know, really any big company, um, but like an IBM, which has employees in all 50 states, they are going to seek to have um, kind of their insurance be self-insured so that um, their, their employees in all 50 states kind of have 
generally the same coverage um, unless there are some state requirements. So like in Massachusetts, when they first passed their um, changes, some large employers had to make sure that their benefits met uh, Massachusetts, not because they were required to under their, um, as a insurance company, but that it was um, an individual requirement that uh, the insurance was uh, kind of met the standards of Massachusetts. Jane has a question. Actually, yeah, I just have a little bit of a comment to follow up on Dan's comment. It, Dan's point about multi-state employers who have um, employees in multi-states being most likely to self-funded. Many of you know that we allow self-funded group health plans to opt into our State Balance Billing Protection Act. And including PEB and SEB lives, it's 800,000 lives in the state that have opted in. And if you look at the list of health plans, self-funded health plans that have opted in, it is almost always an employer that just has employees in Washington state. So that's an example where it was an additional benefit that they could offer their employees, but the big multi-state employers still tended not to take advantage of that largely because of the state-to-state -state variability in their health plans. So what are the opportunities for Washington, right? It's the largest pool of dollars. Like this is where all like the money is when it comes to um, uh, to the insurance system. This is where the money gets spent, um, even though it is not the largest line for hospitals per se. It's where the dollars are right now, and part of that is because employers overpay. So if we think about the range of who pays what um, in our system, um, Medicaid pays the lowest. Medicare pays a little more than Medicaid, um, and employer, employers pay a lot. Um, you know, sometimes 200, sometimes 300, sometimes 400% of Medicare um, for the same thing. Um, and so uh, there is a business case to be made, um, but along with that business case comes the business case of change management and how to work with employees um, and what that change looks like. So on the next slide, um, I wanted to kind of think about how all of those coverage kind of uh, elements break down inside the federal government. And generally, we think about three agencies being mostly in charge here. HHS is obviously in charge of Medicare, Medicaid. Um, HHS has oversight over how the marketplaces function, but not the dollars in the marketplace. Um, but and, and I kind of highlighted um, a couple of different um, programs here that come into play because just to highlight um, the complexity and like who knew that healthcare was so complex, um, that dollars into the healthcare system come from a lot more places than just insurance coverages, right? And so when you think about how do providers get the dollars that they need to run their operations and to provide services. It's not just insurance payments, um, reimbursements for services. Uh, so federally qualified health centers, in addition to getting reimbursements um, from uh, insurance and coverage elements, they get dollars from the federal government um, through the HRSA program uh, at HHS. HRSA also provides payments to hospitals um, and assists in um, graduate medical education. And so, yes, some of the uh, way we pay to train doctors in our hospitals um, is through insurance payments. There are also dollars that come from other places to help to um, pay for those, those, uh, those, that kind of doctor training, physician training, especially in, um, in lower income hospitals, hospitals that operate um, with lower margins um, or in challenged areas. So then you have Treasury, which controls the premium tax credits in the marketplace. And I kind of put Treasury and IRS as the health, employer health insurance exclusion. One of the largest line items uh, in healthcare cost, if you really break it down, is the tax credit that employers are able to claim um, for paying for their employees' health care. Um, this is statutory. This is not something that IRS can decide like, oh, we're going to fix that. Um, and so, but it, but they are the ones who implement it because they're the ones um, who collect those uh, tax filings from uh, employers. 
Um, and then finally, the Department of Labor. So oversight and enforcement of ERISA and ERISA violations lives at the Department of Labor. Um, also at the Department of Labor is COBRA. So when you are uh, an employee of a large employer, uh, over 50 employees, over 25 employees, sorry, if you are, if you are separated from service um, for a, a few reasons, um, including you're laid off um, or uh, you are uh, an employee, um, you carry your benefits uh, for uh, your family, um, but you just turned 65, and so now you're Medicare eligible, right? COBRA is the program by which uh, you'll, you or your family members can retain coverage um, from your employer, paying 103% of the cost of that coverage. Um, so whereas you might have been paying maybe a $350 a month for your premium and the employer covered the rest, you're separated from service, you get that COBRA bill and it might be $1,200 or $1,300 a month um, for that coverage. So what's important on the next slide is digging into where these federal silos allow for state flexibility. For a state like Washington to come in and say, we wanna change things we want to take what you're doing, federal government, and bring it into Washington and make it work for us um, and do it in a way that we see fit. Where do those flexibilities live? Right. So in the green, you have Medicaid, marketplace premium tax credits. That's where the flexibility is most generous for states right now. And then in yellow, you have kind of COBRA and Medicare. And that's because you can kind of do your own thing, but it might not be complete and there might be limitations. Um, so in Medicare, we saw what Maryland and Pennsylvania did. There might be opportunities to go even farther than that um, with an open administration and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation um, allowing more flexibilities. And in COBRA, um, while it is a federal law, there are ways that states can build in around COBRA to make it uh, last a little longer, to make it um, you know, a little more affordable depending on, uh, on what's in your state. There are, in the red here, you've got the places where there isn't a whole lot of flexibility at all. all right, so ERISA is one of those, um, bill, those, one of those statutes that no one ever wants to touch. There's a ton of case law around it. Um, there are really not ERISA waivers. There's one ERISA waiver, it's in Hawaii, um, and they asked for that waiver while ERISA was being passed in 1974 to protect their market. The employer health insurance exclusion from the tax uh, code, that's a statutory requirement. There's really not flexibility there. I mean, how HRSA pays, um, HRSA is probably not going to change the way it works for in one state versus another state. Um, and so uh, that's kind of an important thing to, to think about. On the next slide, I wanna talk about how some of these flexibilities kind of interact, right? So we talked about Medicare and flexibilities and Medicaid in the marketplace, but the real question is, is one at the end, like how do the flexibilities work with each other? So one of the challenges here is like Medicaid says, you can pay for coverage a whole bunch of different ways, but there's a question about what are the upper bounds, right? Will Medicaid allow you to pay more than what it currently pays overall? Um, and probably not unless you can find uh, other savings, right? So Medicaid requires those demonstration waivers to be budget neutral. Now, Budget, the, the creation of budget neutrality can be a bit of fuzzy math. Um, and there are plenty of states who claimed a budget neutral program um, and spent three times what their Medicaid budget was going to be. There are other states who, you know, you can create trend lines that are totally impossible to meet um, and claim you've made budget neutrality. But there are other limits inside Medicaid that could be a challenge, right? So if you think about a Washington state unified program and say, we want to pay the same for every person that goes and gets an appendectomy at a Washington hospital um, because we have a unified system. Medicaid is going to have to be okay with you breaking one of their rules, which is their upper payment limit. They say that medic a Medicaid enrollee cannot um, have a reimbursement for a service higher than a certain upper threshold. And they look at that kind of more in the aggregate than on a person by person basis. 
But if you're kind of bringing everybody in Medicaid up to pretty high payment levels, you might be bumping up against that limit. So then you've got a challenge. Um, I think Medicare has, is gonna have similar questions about who gets to decide what new benefits are available, um, right? And so we, when we look at like the, all, the new Alzheimer's drug, um, Medicare gets to say who's doing kind of how that, um, that drug is made available to persons. And so there are some questions about what type of flexibility Medicare would give to a state there. And then you've got the marketplace waivers um, and those have their own requirements and restrictions. And one of the biggest challenges here is that none of these waivers as it stands right now can allow you to, to kind of leverage savings in one to pay for the other. They are all currently required to be standalone. Um, and so that's one of the challenges that, that are going to need to be overcome. So then there's this question of like, do you, do you try to work in this model or do you try to identify uh, legislative authority at the federal level to do something new. So on the next slide, I want to talk about kind of how kind of some of these things to think about in a unified funding model. So one of the kind of key elements is that Medicare, Medicaid and CHIP marketplace it is considered a federal entitlement. And so whatever Washington does, that federal entitlement would need to be maintained. I don't see a way in which that kind of um, an administration that would be open to um, a state-based model would be okay with the loss of that entitlement. Um, you know, how do you maintain those limits, right? So as, as I was talking about, like a single payment rate might not conform to flexibilities in Medicare or in Medicaid. Um, and if you're trading that for that flexibility, and this is kind of one of those, one of the kind of um, things that, you, that states often dance around here. The feds are usually willing to give you a lot of flexibility as a state in exchange for federal budget certainty. So if you can say to them, we are never ever going to spend more than our current budget plus inflation times 1.1. They're gonna be like, yeah, I'm cool with that. Your advocates are gonna look at that and say, that's a block grant. Um, and so the, those are one of the kind of some of the challenges that kind of get played against each other. And there are going to be some administrations, some federal administrations that say, if somebody calls that a block grant, I can't give it to you. So there are some political risks there. Um, crafting the payment model, right? How do you take everybody in Washington and put them into a single place and pay for all of the care? Like that's, gonna, that's something that hasn't been created yet. So we can talk about like building on those flexibilities in Medicare and Medicaid, but like thinking about a single statewide payment structure um, would be new um, and would get a lot of conversation um, stirred up uh, among your states. Um, if you do that, um, I'd be interested in becoming a paid lobbyist because I'm pretty sure there would be full employment. Um, and kind of managing to that budget is gonna require different payment. You, you're not gonna be able to do your straight up fee for service. Um, it's go, probably gonna require global budgeting um, on hospitals. It's probably gonna require, um, I'm thinking like a state run, um, state operated pharmacy benefit manager um, because that's how pharmaceuticals get to pharmacies and get into the hands of um, of patients now. Um, and so how do you, you know, do you procure a PBM? Do you think, right? So all of those little questions kind of come in to what is it, what, what do the Fed, what does the federal government allow you to do? So that's my presentation. Um, I want to thank you for um, indulging me and letting me go through this and giving you a bit of a graduate seminar um, as I give my students and I'm happy to take questions. Representative Schmick, go ahead. Thank you, I uh, appreciate that. Um, could you give some examples of savings that you referred to in Maryland? Uh, that there was, you said there was a lot of savings in Medicare and they have a waiver to uh, watch over that. Yeah. Uh, can you give some examples? Yeah, so I don't have the numbers right in front of me, um, but basically what the, uh, the Healthcare Cost Commission in, um, in Maryland is able to do is say, um, no insurance carrier 
um, and no, and the federal government through Medicare um, cannot pay more than X. They set a ceiling for a service. Um, so maybe appendectomy is like a great one, right? Nobody's going to pay more than, you know, seven thousand dollars for an appendectomy anywhere in our state. You can pay lower, and you can negotiate, and maybe you can drive. Uh, more patients to a certain network to, to help to negotiate with your providers, but you've got that limit. And in the aggregate, those limits reflect a reduction in overall Medicare spending. And so okay. they've got like these really smart actuaries inside Maryland that say, how much would Medicare spend? And let's set our rates so that our expected spend is say 5% less than what Medicare spends. And then we'll take those dollars and drive them into other, um, other population health efforts that are actually gonna drive it down more because if we can invest in keeping people with diabetes healthy, then we're gonna spend even less in the hospital because our utilization is gonna go down, not just our rates. So a very rudimentary understanding from what you under, from way you explain it is, they set an upper price limit, which was lower than the Medicare payment level. And that difference was what, what they uh, claimed as savings, correct? Basically, that's how it works. They changed their payment model um, so that they don't pay fee for service. They pay through global budgets. And that's kind of one of the ways. So it's actually, it's pretty darn close to what the Medicare payment limit is. But the way that they set how the claiming works um, is where they create the savings. But it, the easiest way to think about it is yes, they set rates across the boards so that nobody could kind of overspend. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. J. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Dan. It's late in the day, so I will be brief. As I was listening to you, I would actually think it would be great if you thought about job security because you know Willy Wonka did things that didn't exist either and and when I think about the Department of Veterans Affairs which pretty much is a universal health care coverage system uh, I'm just really wondering well what lessons could we learn from there and when I think about the morbid morbidity mortality rates among people of color when I think about the difficulty or even people dying because they have low vision and cannot read a prescription or when I think about the fact that ch children cannot have get healthy dental care be because of poverty or whatever I I'm thinking that perhaps if we're willing in this state to go down this road perhaps we might really want to have a conversation around what it would take to ensure that all were insured and we work out that payment structure. I know the Department of Veterans Affairs is a federal government a cabinet and perhaps they have a different structure than you shared with us today. Thank you very much, by the way, for the very comprehensive presentation. Yet, I just would want to, from the Office of Equity's perspective, when we think about health, wealth, and well-being of so many Washingtonians, when health is compromised, so often is their livelihood their wealth and their well-being. I, I think the points that you make are, are incredibly valid. And I think that when we think about how the system that I just uh, spent a bunch of time talking through was built, um, it's built in a way that uh, was designed with structural racism at its root. There's a reason that uh, Medicaid was limited to certain uh, income levels um, and paid less. Um, and if, if Washington is going down a path of creating something new, doing so in a way that is equity centered uh, and focused on all people uh, could create a model in which those vestiges of racism could be eliminated um, or at least mitigated um, so, so all Washingtonians could have um, the chance to live the healthiest life they can without the burdens of bureaucracy. Thank you. 
Um, that's really hard to follow up on. Are there any other questions or comments for Dan? Um, we are running a little bit behind, but I want to thank you, Dan, because that was really great. Um, just so all encompassing of all the things that we really need to think about. Um, to thank, thank you for your time. Thank you for the invitation. It was my pleasure. All right, so next we have Liz Arjun and Gary Cohen from Health Management Associates. So again, the consultants who helped with the um, Universal Healthcare Work Group, and now they're here helping us with the commission and the report that needs to go to the legislature. Um, Liz, Gary, I don't know which one of you is up. I, I'm going to go first. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, thanks Chair, Chair Lowe. It's nice to be with all of you again. Um, I, as Vicki mentioned, I was part of the team that supported the UHC work group before, and I'm really happy to see the progress that has been made. I was with you back in January, but just even through this last legislative session, there's just so much going on to, to just keep moving forward. And so it's great to be here. Um, and I do, I do want to acknowledge the comments that we've already received earlier through public comment um, and that I've seen a couple in my email about the draft report. So I just want to underscore this is draft. That's why we're bringing it to you today, because we know you guys are the experts and we know that you're going to have a lot to, to add to improve what we're trying to put forward here. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to fly through as much as I can because we don't have a lot of time. Um, Quickly, I just want to say we're going to do, I want to provide a timeline of what's going on with the report because I think there's a lot of questions about, hey, we're, when are we going to talk about financing? When are we going to talk about reimbursement rates, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to provide that overview. And then a quick, um, I'll talk section one and Gary's going to talk section three, and then maybe we'll have a few minutes left for discussion and next steps. Um, so the report uh, really is following what was outlined in the legislation. There's seven key sections in the legislation. Um, section one is, a, is about a past analysis, it's landscape of where we've been, what we're doing, um, what's the research that's been done on moving to a universal system. Um, section three, again, we're going to talk about that today, is just making sure we're clear on what are the design components of a universal system. In June, we're going to come back and talk about readiness to uh, kind of move forward from where we are to a universal system. And we'll have some preliminary discussion about sequencing and strategy. Um, we'll come back to that again in July, where we'll flesh out a little bit more of the detailed strategy and identify some short-term solutions, some of which I feel like we heard in the conversation that was shared by Evan and Jane earlier today, those kinds of strategies and building on what's in place. And then in August, uh, the fun work of talking about reimbursement rates and setting up a finance committee. So that's the, the, the order of how we're doing all this. And there's other presentations that are gonna be intermixed uh, throughout this whole period. Um, there, are, where there are things that we need to be talking about or that you all need to be talking about as you do this work. And so that's not in here. This is just the pieces that we're, that we're bringing to you over the next few months. Um, next slide. So again, section one, landscape of uh, making sure you all have a common understanding of the problems of the healthcare system. And, an understanding of some of the policy responses that have been developed and that are out there to address these problems. And section three is about understanding the design component and distinguishing between design components and what are the goals of the system and how we're gonna to try to address that. And then finally, what's, uh, what's coming next? So next slide. So uh, next slide, thanks. Okay, so we're going to look at the problems of the healthcare system in Washington and solutions very quickly. Um, this slide should be very familiar to you. Um, OFM talked about the rate of uninsured in Washington State um, back at the February meeting, I believe, and really striking data point. The rate of uninsured now in Washington State is the lowest it's ever been, 4.7%. Um, that's huge. Um, a lot of the work happened pre-COVID because of the ACA. But that was built upon decades of work here in the state to, to ensure uninsured populations. And then finally, really coming down uh, because of the work that happened to maintain coverage and increase coverage as a result of COVID. Um, and there are some, you know, some things that OFM talked about that the commission should be aware of that could happen with this rate um, as the public health emergency unwinds. But the good news is this is where we're at right now. 
Um, this means about 370,000 people are uninsured in the state. That's in terms of real numbers. But again, there, this is not all good news because if we go to the next slide, this, um, actually not the next slide, but this slide, um, I'm just gonna breeze over this. This is a level setting in terms of who's covered by what bucket of insurance. Dan talked about kind of some of the parameters around that. Um, I'm realizing we need to actually add another another data point in the draft summary that actually talks about the state employees um, because I think that's really important for some of the considerations you have to do. But this is again, just a level setting, who's getting insurance from what source. Okay, next slide. So this is what I was gonna focus on. While the uninsured rate is low, we have significant disparities. Uh, this is a huge problem and uh, it's just, it's been getting worse, I think. While the rate for between rural and urban counties has shrunk, it's still there. Um, but I think there are some really um, striking and uh, disturbing points here that I think echo what Dr. J and Dan were talking about earlier. Um, the uninsured rate for some populations has actually gone up and the uninsured rate between the Hispanic population and the non-Hispanic white population, the disparity has increased to uh, from 2.5 times the rate in 2014 to four times the rate in 2019. So while the rate is coming down, the gap is getting bigger between who's getting covered and who's not. So this is a real area of focus for us or for the commission and what, um, what the strategies need to be going forward. So next slide. Okay, um, another key component uh, that the legislation should ask to, ask to look at is what's going on with costs. Um, there's been great work from the Healthcare Cost Transparency Board. You heard from Annalisa at the last meeting about the work they're doing. Um, and OIC has also been looking at this as well. And this slide just shows that we are continuing to see costs increase over time. Um, and a real exclamation point on this is the 2021 OIC analysis, which showed a 13% increase in costs for the commercially insured population, which is twice the rate of inflation. So um, lots going on in this space. Um, to address that, so we'll go to the next slide. There have been a number of initiatives that have the legislature has supported to try to get at this problem. Um, the one I just mentioned, the Healthcare Cost Transparency Board from 2020, um, the, but there's been work before that, even with the value-based payments, and even decades before this, the state and the legislature have been trying to get their arms around what's going on and find ways to address this. And I think um, Evan, again, mentioned um, the new legislation from 2022, the Prescription Drug Afford Affordability Board. Um, so looking at uh, looking at what's going on there, but you know, I think one of the most important points around these initiatives is that there's a lot of work to really like look at what's going on. So it's it's trying to unpack kind of the kind of uh, not the not transparent uh, situation that's going on with costs because sometimes there's a cost that increase because there's a new therapy or a new disease as Dan mentioned. So these initiatives are really focused on trying to understand that and find solutions to addressing them. So next slide. Um, again, quality is another piece of the puzzle, um, and this is another uh, thing that Washington has been focused on for years. Um, I think that, you know, I'm not going to go into any detail on this, but this, there are, these are some of the initiatives that are captured in the report, and um, there's, you know, continuing efforts to try to, to Im Im improve quality. There's been some effort to look at quality. Um, you know, among different populations, but that I think is something that can be strengthened. Um, getting to what Dr. J was saying earlier, um, using the data that we do have to look closer at where those disparities exist. But there's a lot that has been going on to try to get um, a sense of what's the quality of care that people are receiving. So, and we can go to the next slide. Um, the report also asks the commission to look at workforce analyses and trends. And so a couple of data points on this. Um, we have, and, and OFM is just an incredible resource. Washington is so lucky to have them, but this is from an OFM study talking about the rate of physicians in the state. And the rate of physicians is going up, um, but it's, uh, if we can go to the next slide, um, it's, not, it's not uniform across the state. So a couple of pieces around the physicians, they're, not dispro they're, they're disproportionately allocated throughout the state. 
Um, and there's a higher percentage of specialists to primary care doctors. So I just on this point about the dis disparity about where the provider, where the physicians are, um, I had to choose between two maps and one of and one of the maps showed the percentage of where the physicians lived and practiced. And another one was the, the number of physicians per 100,000. And you can see while King County is pretty high, Chelan by, has more physicians per 100,000 than any other county in the state. So I think it's something interesting to think about. Um, why is that and what's going on there? So um, we can go to the next slide. But we know that physicians are not the only uh, healthcare provider that we need so much of. And we heard a little bit about this um, in Evan's update. Uh, two of the key areas where we have significant shortages um, that need to be factored into the work of this commission are uh, behavioral health and nurses across all levels. And this picture right here, this table really shows, um, if you look on the right-hand column upcoming in the next five years, the job openings and some of these, uh, some of these professions that we're talking about, and it's pretty staggering. And so there is a lot of work going on across the state to address this, but I think it's really something to be thinking about. Um, and, and these numbers I should point out do not, they're, they're pre-COVID. And we know that in behavioral health in particular, that is, there's gonna probably be a much bigger number um, when they do the study again. So um, next slide. Okay. Uh, again, another shout out to OFM, a new uh, report just came out last month about consolidation trends and analyses. Um, and I think there's just a couple of key points here. The consolidation, it should not be surprising to, to anyone because we hear about it all the time in the news here. But um, in 1986, uh, hospitals operated in six counties, accounting for 60% of the population in 2017 close to 90% of the population lived in a county with at least one hospital system. And I think the a real big point here is in 2017, there were eight counties where the only hospitals were part of systems. So um, this has significant implications for when we tell people you need to go shop for coverage and find the best, find the best value. Uh, if they don't have a lot of options, uh, they really can't do that. Um, so if we go to the next slide, there's just some more information about the consolidation trends. Uh, this is just a really interesting report if you haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, I did get a comment about this already, and so we're going to add a little bit more to this uh, section of the report in terms of consolidation among Catholic hospitals, but we've, we've gotten some feedback on this already. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so all that is to say, we've got all this work that's happened across these different per, different parts of the healthcare system. And as a result, there's been a huge interest in the last few years in Washington around moving to a universal healthcare system. And um, as I mentioned, I was part of the work group that supported this. And so this report um, did find that it looked at three different models of moving to universal coverage, um, model A, model B, and model C. Um, and I, again, I heard the feedback that we need to include the out your savings on model A and B for folks, but I just want to say, I think a really important thing and acknowledge is that we're actually doing model C already in this state. Um, that model C was fill in the gaps and the legislature, I think, took up that mantle right away about moving forward immediately by um, investing in some uh, efforts to fill in the gaps. And so if we go to the next slide. Angela, I, just to kind of say, we've um, addressing affordability, the work of the Health Benefits Exchange and Healthcare Authority around Cascade Care. We're filling in some gaps there. And then uh, mentioned again earlier by Evan, Washington Health Benefits Exchange uh, submittal for a 1332 waiver to begin allowing uh, individuals who are currently barred from shopping and purchasing coverage on the exchange to be able to do that. It would be the first uh, waiver in the country to do that. We're 1332 waiver to do that. And I'm sure we'll hear more from our the colleagues at the from the health benefits exchange about this. But all this is to say is that there is a lot to build on in this state in terms of moving forward. Um, and um, we're you know I think it, there's a lot to be done around alignment. But uh, we're Washington is starting in a good place in terms of trying to kind of move to the end here, um, whatever that end may be. So. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Gary, 
who's going to talk about section three and the design components, and we'll get your questions later. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Liz. Hi, I'm Gary Cohn. It's a privilege to be with you today and to be helping with this important work. Um, I have nine minutes, uh, so I'm going to try to really hit the high points. The purpose of this section was to identify the core functions that any healthcare financing and delivery system has to uh, provide and to raise some questions for you all uh, for your consideration and ultimate you know, discussion and recommendation and eventually the legislature to look at in, in figuring out how to move forward toward the goal of a uniform financing system and universal coverage. I'm gonna hit one high point on each of these core elements today and there's a lot more detail in the actual report. On eligibility uh, and who's gonna be in, if the goal is to get everybody into one system, um, it's just important to recognize that there are some um, people who have entitlements under various aspects of federal law that you need to think about, are they going to be in or out? Are you giving them an option to come in or be out? Uh, and that includes, uh, Dan talked about people who are in self-funded plans governed by ERISA. That includes federal employees who have the right to coverage uh, under the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program. It includes people under TRICARE of the VA. So there are just pockets of people out there that you need to think about. Are they going to be in or out or will they have the right to be in or out? Um, next slide, please. Um, on benefits and services, uh, I think the uh, working group assumed that the benefits that would be provided would be essentially the essential health benefits under the Affordable Care Act. Question about adult dental or vision, which are not covered under EHB or under Medicare. And then there's an important issue that there are certain benefits that are provided by Medicaid, uh, long-term services and supports, for example non-urgent transportation for medical uh, appointments, for example. Are you gonna, is the idea to provide those services to everybody, which costs money? Or if not, we're gonna continue to have to se segment our population into those who previous to this new system would have been eligible for Medicaid and would have been eligible for those services and those people who are not. That's a big issue that you all are gonna have to grapple with. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of financing, Dan did a great job of talking about some of the issues. I want to frame it this way. If the goal is to take all of the money that is currently being spent on health care services from the federal government and from the state, put it in a pool, stop collecting premiums from individuals and employers, and instead fund other sources of funding, principally taxes to, to fill you know, sort of that gap and have one big pocket of money that's gonna pay for all the healthcare services for all the residents of the state. The issues that Dan raised about, could you do that with Medicaid funding? Could you do that with Medicare funding are very important. And what I wanna urge you to do is think about the issue of Medicare specifically early on because it's a really key issue and there are some significant legal challenges there. So you're going to need to get, you know, and I'll just say this, the, the way the, the things that Medicare has allowed Pennsylvania and Maryland to do are really quite different from what you would need to do to create this uniform financing system and include all of the Medicare funding in it. They're really quite different um, and much broader. And while, and when we talk about federal waivers, it's important to be clear that the, there are 1115 waivers under Medicaid, there are 1332 waivers under the ACA. There's nothing quite like that in the Medicare program. These CMMI demonstrations that are for different payment models are really quite different from the kinds of waivers that exist under for Medicaid and, and, and um, the marketplace and from what you would need to, to do this. So I just, this is like a plea. <laughs> really look hard at that issue early on in your consideration because it's gonna affect everything else that, that you do. Um, the next slide, the issue I wanna raise here is, um, there are a lot of people who believe that if we're ever gonna to get to higher quality and, and lower cost care, we need to move away from fever service and we, and we need to move more toward value-based payment models. Um, the quest, a question that you need to ask in de designing this new system is who's going to do that and how is it going to be done? Historically, in Washington and pretty much everywhere else in the Medicaid program, when we're talking about value-based purchasing models, it's being done by private Medicare uh, managed care organizations. It's not so much being done by the governments. 
Same thing is true in Medicare. Most of that work is being done in Medicare Advantage plans, not by traditional Medicare, which is primarily a fee-for-service program. So if you want to encourage managed care, if you want to encourage coordination of care, and if you want to encourage value-based models in a model A type of program, you need to think about how is that going to, how are you going to do that in that kind of program and, and how, and who's going to do it? Um, and that leads to the next slide, which is infrastructure. I think a key point that often is missed in looking at moving from the system that we have now to a more of a state run system is that there are a lot of functions that are being performed by private sector today. You know, Dan mentioned pharmacy benefit managers, right? You have pharmacy benefit managers who are out there. Um, you're gonna, if you wanna have a, a state administered system, you're gonna need to build in the capacity to perform those functions within the state. Are you gonna do that by hiring state employees? Are you gonna do that by contracting out to, to private companies to do it? Um, you know, how, how is it gonna be done? Um, and this is not an argument to say, don't do it. It's just an argument to say, well, you really need to think about what are the capabilities that exist currently within uh, the state and what are the capabilities that would have to be built and you know, what would the time that would take to do that and, and, you know, and how would you organize it? Uh, and that leads to the last slide, which has to do with governance and the questions of who's gonna run all of this? Are you creating a new sort of Uber uh, agency that's going to be responsible for all of uh, uh, healthcare administration in the state of Washington? Are you going to build on existing agencies that you have today? Uh, are you going to have a combination of, of new and old? Um, and who's going to be responsible for you know, regulation of, of the program? And those are also very key and important questions that need to be addressed. So that's what I have. Happy to take questions in the remaining two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary and Liz. Are there any questions? And do we have your emails in case there's questions? I guess sure. we can talk about the opportunity to edit the, the report too and that. Sure. Other questions. Yeah, I think Mandy will work with you, Vicki, on making sure that the comments from the commission are funneled to us. Um, just want to kind of mention this last slide. I, the, again, as, we, as I said before, the next step is really to try to answer to the extent that we can, um, how, how is Washington prepared to meet these activities and talking about the strategies and sequencing of how you would get there. Um, so I have a request of all of the commission members. We are preparing a readiness assessment survey that we're going to ask you to fill out probably late next week. Um, to just answer some basic questions about what are some of the functions you are responsible for, what are some short-term steps you see that could that need to happen. So to just kind of get a sense from all of you representing your state agencies about um, what the lift would be um, and what are some thoughts about getting there. So I would just ask that when you get that survey, uh, you have you'll have about two weeks to complete it, and we need that in order to do the next section of the report. So. Thank you, Liz. Okay, so are any, any questions? We've got no minutes. <laughs> so our next meeting is June 16th from 3 to 5 p.m. You, after we're done with this meeting, sometime between today and tomorrow, I think you're gonna get a Word document of the draft report. So to allow for easier editing. And then we're gonna get a survey from um, HMA and we need to fill that out within the next two weeks. Any questions about any of that? Or anything for the good of the order? All right then. I just wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Thank all of our presenters for this really rich material that we have. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, sounds like we funneled them through Mandy. And I hope everybody has a great evening. I call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>